Yeah, the sun's coming out, so um, thank you for joining us today. I think we're quite here, so let me know and I'll shout a little bit louder. Mm. And I, I'm going to give, be giving a talk, and I would like you all to be involved in this. And we're going to play a little game, pass the parcel, starting at the back. I want you all to feel this. Really <laughs> feel the weight. Of it. So everyone wants to see it. No phone now. Sorry, Nanny. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so it's some 15 months ago now that I first heard the term microbiome. And I have to say, I was um, amazed to hear that I was playing host to a whole range of fauna and flora. I started doing some research and realised that this wasn't a well kept secret. In fact, the Bell Bookshop have got a whole section dedicated to women's gut health. So I started reading, and reading, and reading. And they're all saying the same thing. If we're going to take a proactive approach to our health, we need to start with the gut. I switched on the TV, and there it was again, the microbiome. This time, being linked to a debilitating disease, Parkinson's. Every day, the name term microbiome is becoming part of our everyday vocabulary. You couldn't open the papers without another article about gut health. Radio programs, TV programs, all saying exactly the same thing. We need to start looking at the gut. So I did. I began with the gut health program, which I've since repeated twice, and I know that many of you here have done a similar program. I started looking at my diet, and I made modifications, and I invested in a range of supplements. And do you know what? Despite too many glasses of red wine last night, <laughs> I'm feeling quite good. So, I now want to hand over to an expert who's going to tell us a little bit more about exactly what the microbiome is and how it impacts on our physical and psychological health. Ralph has been a practicing GP for 30 years, and he's managed to combine his medical background with his love of sport. In 1992, he became the first GP to be assigned to a premiership football team, not one of the southern teams, way up north. Yay! <laughs> he's going to tell us more about the microbiome and how it's the impact it has on our health. Brad, I'm going to hand over. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. That's very kind. Uh, let me tell you, for me, as a northerner, it's an absolute delight and pleasure to be here in this historic club. For those of you who don't know, it's the 200th anniversary of Leander. Um, it was in a bit of trouble in the early 80s. And in 1983, the old boys were, to use a Sheffield expression, put out by a new generation who rebuilt this place. This club has had 124 Olympic medalists. Since 2000, they've had 40 Olympic and Paralympic Olympians. That is incredible. In 1991, Jürgen Grober, who is now GD Olympic coach, walked in here as Steve Redgrave's personal coach. And one of the members said, yes, that's all well and good, but what do you actually do for a living? <laughs> it just shows that as people, we can change our mentality. We can change things that we've historically done. I am now 57, I'm still working as a GP, and I think amongst all of you, I'm probably one of the most privileged people in the room, because I love getting up in the morning and going to work every day. But I have to tell you, the NHS is in crisis. Does anyone have any idea what these figures allude to? NHS spending in billions, absolutely 100% right. When the NHS was founded by Ben, his simple idea was that if we had a minimal expenditure on people's well-being, 
and could give them basic health care, people would not get ill. So in 1950, the spending on the NHS was 500 million. Two years after I qualified, in 1985, it was 41 billion. <clears throat> Last year, it was 124 billion. And the government have announced, magically, there's 20, million that, 20 billion that's coming in. By 2022, it will be almost 150 billion pounds. Now that is an astronomical sum of money. It's worrying because it's not affordable. But it's also worrying because currently the NHS is 100,000 staff short. Excuse my Yorkshire accent, I should have said staff. <laughs> or should say staff. <laughs> the Nuffield, or it was actually King's Fund, the day before yesterday, announced that by 2020 the NHS will be quarter of a million staff short, and by 2030, 350,000 short of doctors, nurses, technicians. Now that to me is a massive alarm bell, because it means that we all need to start taking more control of our health and well-being. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. I'm not lecturing you, I'm talking. <laughs> So, every year, every winter, we hear about a bed crisis in the NHS, don't we? We hear on the news, and invariably, probably starting in mid-December, we'll hear about A&E crisis, and bed blocking, and bed jamming. Part of the reason for that is that, two years after I qualified, there were 300,000 NHS beds in the UK. Last year, it was half that number. People still get ill. Population is growing. So you can see that in 87, there were more general and acute beds than there are total beds in the NHS. So someone, at some stage, has to realise we actually just need more hospital beds. Or, as a population, we have to get less ill. This just goes more into this bed blocking and bed crisis. One of the interesting things is the government announced recently a minister for preventing suicide. This was the number of mental health beds in the NHS in 1987 probably about 70,000. Now there's less than 20,000. People with mental illness need help. There is not the care in our communities at the moment to look after those people. One of the things that you will learn, hopefully later on, is that the microbiome is a key factor in our mental health and well-being. So costs are going up, age and demand are going up. Um, in my practice in Sheffield, my practice population is 8,500. I think the population of Henley is about 11,000. So I work in a practice that would almost look after the whole of this community. Our oldest patient, and it's a working class area of Sheffield, was 106 this year. Now, in 1985, if anyone had told me I would be looking after someone who was 106, I'd think they'd have been drinking way too much tequila. <laughs> but as a population, because we can now fight heart disease, heart failure, COPD, treatments for cancer are getting better, people aren't dying in the way that they used to. We are getting older. The reason that we're currently getting older is because the drugs are better. We are identifying disease earlier. 
our treatment options are greater. But the capacity of the NHS is actually going down. It's the cost is rising. And as I've already mentioned, staffing is going down. Can you hear me on that? You can't hear me, come and sit near the front. There's lots of seats up here. What does this figure mean? Oh, we love being the best at something, don't we? We all want to be elite. We all want to be fabulous at what we do. Any idea what this number is? Twins are, we are number one in Europe at being obese. That is a simple fact. It's really sad. In this country, that is how much we spend on treating obesity. Now, excuse me one second. I'll do this so you can all see. This is my standard. Now, everyone in this room thinks that is madness, don't you? Yes. Do you agree? Who isn't saying doing much? Please tell me. No, please tell me. What's in it? Kiwi lime, matcha, cucumber, flaxseed, cross vitamins B2, B3, B6, C, and E. Who would agree that this is a super healthy drink? Yes. Most people would say this is reasonable. Okay. So, I'll pour myself a glass of this. Approximately half. I, but I'm telling you, that is approximately half. Does everyone, I know everyone has had their phones switched off. I actually want you to all to switch your phones off. Do you all have an app called Food Scanner? Please get it. Get the Food Scanner app. Because using this, and it's an NHS, it's free. You scan a barcode and it tells you how much sugar and salt is in every product in the supermarket. Okay? Um, so, who's looking bored? That's possibly have a chance. Yakult, we've all seen it advertised on the TV as a wonderful probiotic. Okay, this is something that's going to save your life. The company that produces it spends hundreds of thousands advertising. This product contains water, skimmed milk, glucose fructose syrup, sugar, maltodextrin, flavorings. Let's do a scan on this. Who has chapter I'm on now, sorry. Okay. 
How many cubes of sugar are in this? 15.9. So, yakles, yakles contain, but in seven days, 16 cubes of sugar. You wouldn't actually, if you're trying to lose weight and help yourself, you are, you can't possibly know what is in our foods. A nutritious bar full of fruit and nuts. Each one of these contains six cubes of sugar. So we think we're making healthy choices. You cut out your chocolate, you cut out your biscuits, you cut out your cake. Waitrose, tomatoes with herbs. Five cubes of added sugar. Here's my favourite. No, but this is good. This is, this is our lives. These are the choices that we make. <laughs> Plain yogurt contains no sugar, no added sugar, but it also contains bifidobacterium, lactobacillus acidophilus, and staph thermophiles, three wonderful probiotics. This costs three pounds. This costs 48 pence. This contains sugar. It's marketed really well. This contains no sugar, better range of probiotics, and is a fifth, sixth of the price. Sorry, I'm speaking passionate about this because I am passionate about our health day. So the current cost of treating obesity in this country is 14 billion. By 2025, it will be 25 billion pounds if we do nothing about it. That's terrifying. Because when that happens, the NHS is over. It really is, trust me. It's completely unaffordable. But until we educate people about food and get them to actually look at what they're eating or completely change their eating habits and take responsibility, we are heading for meltdown. Now I know you all came for a talk on the microbiome, so let's crack on. Oh, that's the other fascinating thing. In 1980, 7% of the population were obese. And that's because we've become more sedentary, we have more food choices. Um, in schools, sport isn't seen as important anymore. We're getting away from the competitive spirit and everything has to be inclusive and there should be no losers. Sadly, life isn't like that. I'm sorry to disenfranchise anyone from this talk, but that is the reality. Until we can educate children about health in its broadest terms, about exercise and about eating, we cannot make a change going forwards. These numbers, what, what are these? Quickly, I you episode quick. Yeah. Do you go around talking to schools? <clears throat> No, not yet. But I should do. You should do. Yeah. I'm going to school. I love you too. Should do. So these, sorry, these numbers: 1.4 million, 1.4, 4, 5, 1 in seven hospital beds. This is diabetes. It's 100% directly linked to obesity. Without a shadow of doubt, we know, as a medical profession, and I'm sure most of you know, that the fatter we get the more risk we have of becoming diabetic. And this is a trend that can be reversed. As a society, we can do something about this. Who's got the bag of sugar? 
Where do we get to? Has it been round? Has everyone felt it? Not at all. all. Everyone's felt it. What's the microbiome? That's why you're here. I know there's a couple of people who've written books on the microbiome, which is slightly terrifying. For me. But for the rest of you, um, I hope I can teach you a little something. The microbiome is those bugs that live on and in us. There's over 500 species of bacteria, but probably equally important are the viruses and fungi that live around us. The reason I ask you all to feel the back is because it's actually around about four pounds, the weight of that sugar bag, of bacteria in your gut. Did anyone know that? It's quite a weight of stuff, especially if you're thinking, I've got to lose some weight. Don't, don't lose these four pounds. <laughs> So DNA, if we were to liquidise a human and look at the DNA, probably quite a messy thing to do, look at the DNA that was in that liquid, only 10% of it would be human DNA. The rest would be from those trillions of other organisms that we live in harmony with. It's becoming increasingly evident that the Bacteria that are in our bowel control most of our bodily functions. I think probably one of the most emerging fields of research globally is on the impact that these bacteria have on our mental and physical well-being. This slide basically shows you the scale of what I'm talking about. The most impressive thing for me is that nature has created a single cell barrier from that four pounds of bacteria that are in our gut, which protects the rest of our body from things that could be really toxic. And if we laid out that surface area, it would cover two tennis courts. Bigger than the size of this room is a single layer of cells lining your intestine. I'm very lucky. I had two grandchildren in April. Give me a round of applause. <laughs> Sadly, both of my grandsons were born by caesarean section. One planned, one as an emergency. But with the knowledge that I have, I said to my daughters to tell their obstetricians to get some vaginal flora on a swab and cover my grandkids in those vaginal secretions. Because from the moment that it's true, there's a load of evidence about it. No, no, I, I'm quite interested in it. But what happens when um, a baby's born in the car? Are they still getting... So, babies used to be born in the membrane more often than they are today. Yeah. Um, and some women I've been with, have the baby has been born in the car. So, yeah. that's why I sit on the fence about it, because I've been with women who've used it. And I was quite interested in it, and I thought it was like, hey, yeah, that's what we should do. And I thought, well, what about the babies born in, in the car? Uh, I don't know. No, you see, there's, there's, there's going to be lots of times in this talk where I say, I don't know. There are no experts. Maddie very kindly introduced me as an expert on my microbiome. Don't forget me, I am, on the whole, I think it's... You know, I am not an expert. Yeah, 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 and anyone who tells you they are an expert, probably... Well, it's such a new emerging science. It is. Yeah. Um, but, despite the fact that I think it's now some 20% of children in the UK are born by cesarean section, it's not a routine thing to be done. Section are more prone to develop asthma, to get infections, and to have a, a less less degree of thriving in early age. 
It's an absolute fact, and there is a lot of clinical papers about it. When a baby is born and it's in, it, in the womb, it is, to all intents and purposes, sterile. And I think nowadays we have a tendency to, we all feel children are precious, but we're less likely to expose them to any germs. Everything has to be super clean, sterile. We don't want to pass any bugs to the baby. Actually, probably what we should be doing is passing as many bugs to the baby as possible. Now, I'm not saying go and roll a newborn in a field, but don't be too meticulous about being sterile because it actually isn't doing them any good. This is where the microbiome starts to confuse me. We all think skin is skin, don't we? Skin on your face is the same as the skin on your hand, is the same as the skin on your leg. Bugs don't think that way. The skin on the inside of your arm is populated by a completely different bacterial colony to the skin on your face. That, to me, is remarkable. When you see um, cosmetic companies say that they're developing products that are skin healthy and microbiome friendly, unless they've done a lot of research and are providing prebiotic compounds, it probably isn't true. Here's the gut. Uh, this isn't a biology lesson, by the way. And if you get bored, look out the window, <laughs> go for a walk, it's a beautiful part of the world. But let's talk a little bit about acid and alkaline diets. Who here has heard about alkaline diets being good for you? Yes. The thing is that the stomach gives the hydrochloric acid. It's acid. It's a pH of two. Very little survives in it, unless you're taking something that has been designed to withstand stomach acid. So you're having your alkaline diet, thinking I'm going to detox my body, everything's fantastic. It just becomes acid the moment it hits your stomach. We also have these things, if we're lucky, called kidneys. And your kidney is a fabulous part of nature. It's a wonderful creation, and it's there to maintain the pH of your bodies, all of us, between 7.4 and 7.6. So irrespective of what you eat, or what you're told, or whatever faddy diet some actress is on in Hollywood who's lost loads of weight, food is being converted to acid, and your kidneys will do everything they can to give you a perfect pH balance. Please, I beg you, don't go on these crazy diets. <coughs> bacteria in your stomach are completely different to the bacteria in your large intestine. At the moment, actually, when I was a med student, um, people with ulcers used to have a surgical procedure called pyloroplasty and vagotomy, where they removed part of the stomach and cut the vagus nerve because they thought the vagus nerve was pretty useless and we wouldn't miss it. In 30 years, how wrong can anyone be? because there's something called the gut-brain axis, and the gut talks to the brain, and it talks to the brain through the vagus nerve. pH of the stomach, acid, in the large bowel, small bowel, it's 
becoming less acid and in the large intestine, it's pretty neutral. <coughs> How many people have heard of sending a stool sample to see what your microbiome is like? How many people think that's a good idea? Okay. I, I, Richard, yeah, yeah. I understand why you said that. The problem is, is that different parts of your bowel, as we've already said, have completely different bacterial colonies. Mm. The most important thing is that in your large bowel, you have folds of tissue, almost like a cornfield. The bacteria that you poo out are from the middle. These are independent colonies that hopefully never change. So you actually don't know what your true microbiome is by sending a stool sample. Currently, we don't know, there isn't a technology around, but it is hopefully being developed, where we will all know what our true bacterial populations are in our bowel. So the things that we can do to impact our gut bacteria, and there are things that we have no control of, we can't actually change the amount of acid that our stomachs produce. We can take drugs that suppress the acid, like meprazole or ranitidine that you may have heard of. We can't change the oxygenation in our bowel. We can't change the way that our bowel works in terms of pushing stuff around unless we take pharmaceutical agents. We can't control the amount of mucus that's produced. We probably can control antimicrobial peptides, and we can control those by changing our diet. And I'm going to talk more about that. These are the things that I've already spoken about. PPIs and meprazole, H2 blockers and ranitidine, antibiotics obviously, prokinetic agents, increase the amount of propulsion through the bowel. Pre and probiotics. Who in the room has ever taken a probiotic? Who in the room has taken a prebiotic? Who in the room has taken a prebiotic without knowing it? You have. If you've had fibre, if you eat fibre in your diet, that is a prebiotic. There is no point in taking probiotics, you can have them by the bucket load, if your diet isn't right, if you have a diet that is made up of refined foods, processed foods, sugar, and you are not having fiber and fermented food, the probiotics will not work. Who in the room makes their own kefir? Who in the room makes their own sauerkraut? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> so kefir is like a fermented milk. It's full of really great, it's much better than that Yo Valley yogurt. You can make it yourself, it's really simple. So there's good and bad bacteria. These are the good bacteria. Bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, E. coli. Now, people hear of E. coli infections. The reason you get an E. coli infection, which is actually a good bug, is because you have leaky gut. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The worrying bacteria are Campylobacter, C. diff, and Enterococcus picalis. This causes diarrhea in children. Campylobacter we tend to get from chicken and eggs. I'm not sure which comes first. <laughs> C. diff we get if we have a lot of antibiotics. Older populations, people who've recently had surgery, and people who have decreased immunity can get this and it will kill you. 
And this is the bug that there is no known antibiotic for at the moment. So microbiome, we are learning increasingly. See that <coughs> This is just me having some water, by the way. There's no tricks here. <laughs> We're finding out it has a huge impact on your immunity. <clears throat> your gut actually produces vitamins and hormones. This is new science. Obviously, we digest food from it. But your gut cells produce vitamins if you feed them correctly. And it's increasingly evident that your gut actually has signaling to your DNA and the coded messages that you will pass to your children. This is my favorite slide. I love this. This is a very wide version of twins. These two women are twins. One, I'm a doctor, I'm allowed to now say, I've given myself the ability, is fat. We're allowed to say people are fat. And until we can all use this language, people won't lose weight. If you say, oh, you're looking a little bit heavy, or you're kilogrammically gifted, just, just use language that people understand. One of the twins is fat, one of the twins isn't fat. In this study, and how you can sit in a lab thinking, I've got a great experiment. Let's get some poo from these two women and put the poo into mice. Who's that? Who's that? But anyway, that's exactly what they did. They had a stool sample from this woman, a stool sample from that woman, put them into genetically identical mice, fed the mice, the same diet, one mouse remained thin, one mouse became obese. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is what your gut bacteria do, because they process the way that you use the fuel that you're giving them. Don't you like that slide? I love that slide. <laughs> Here's our diet, high in saturated fats, high as you can see in sucrose, without knowing it. Well, how has this happened? How, how have we, as a UK population, gone from being 7% obese in 1980 to 27% obese in 2018? There's a warning going round in every language about this. For those of you who didn't realise, that was a line from Crazy Horses by the Osmonds. Um, so this is what we expect our gut bacteria to do. I think we all expect you eat food, it's digested, you get the nutrients from it. What, we, what I didn't know is that your gut bacteria bind toxins. So they get rid of arsenic, cadmium, magnesium, things that are bad for you. But they also have an influence on hormones, particularly female hormones around the time of menopause. There's a huge amount of research going on with regard to that at the moment. Your gut bacteria influence your mood because your gut produces serotonin, happiness for you. It produces GABA, which makes us feel less anxious. So if you have a diet that's loaded with sugar and loaded with processed food and is low in fibre, and low in fermented food, you do not produce this. You become anxious. Your diet controls your mental state. 
I have loads of people who come and see me because they have insomnia. They're stressed, they're worried, they can't cope. I say, what do you eat? Well, I have a few coffees every day. I might have a Coke. Um, and then I have a microwave meal. And obviously I'm having Waitrose Essential whole grain blueberry wheat. This, that's hardly a breakfast sized portion, but that contains 10 cubes of sugar. Going back to what I was saying about people think they're making the right choices. They aren't, they haven't. You've all got food scanner downloads now. Mm -hmm. Fertility is more and more women in the UK are unable to conceive. It's a fact. It's because people are probably waiting longer, so your hormonal production has gone down. But also because of dietary choices people are making without realising it. It is impacting fertility. I'm sorry to those people who've written books on this subject. I, I apologise for the basicness of this talk. Do you know what dysbiosis is? So dysbiosis is when the bad bacteria push out the good bacteria. And a lot of that is due again to food choices. The fatter we get, the less exercise we do, the worse food we eat, <clears throat> the more chance you have of developing this condition. Gut bacteria definitely alter the way that we process and utilize sugar and fat. Who's, had who's ever had a sugar craving? Who's ever gone, I need to eat cake? or chocolate. Yeah. That happens, that, the driver for that is not your brain, it's the bacteria in your gut. You are a slave to feeding them. <clears throat> and if you have too many bad bacteria in your bowel, you will eat more and more sugar. It's a fact. So you should do everything that you can to get rid of those little buggers, because they are driving you to obesity and a shorter life. I said this wasn't the biology lecture, but it is a little bit of a biology lecture. Here's your bowel, here's that single layer of cells that are protecting you, and here's the inside of your body. Leaky gut is caused, so a normal cell will have these lovely tight junctions and when you don't have tight junctions you have a wide junction so the gut bacteria can enter your bloodstream. That's fairly straightforward isn't it? <clears throat> this is what having a leaky gut causes. There are definite links to children developing autism, sadly. There are definite links to depression and anxiety. A huge factor in children developing asthma, and the incidence of asthma in this country is going up and up, is a leaky gut leading to asthma. Definitely, leaky gut leads to hypertension and ischemic heart disease. It clogs up your arteries, so you're more likely to have a leg amputation. It causes problems with your liver. There was something on the BBC website this week about obesity and colonic cancer. The second greatest risk of developing cancer in the UK today, after smoking, is being fat. huge amount of research at the moment on gut bacteria and arthritis, both osteo and rheumatoid. It's a big factor in inflammatory joint disease. So this is what happens. 
So we've got that leaky junction, the bugs enter your bloodstream, and they then go to all areas of your body. They go to your brain, they go to your liver, they go to muscle. You can't stop it. But what you can stop is developing that leaky gut in the first place. And you do that by exercising, eating more fibre, eating some fermented foods, which are prebiotics, and then taking some form of probiotic. We don't know yet which the best ones are, but most are either bacillus coagulans or lactobacilli, or a combination of the two. We've mentioned all of these already. This is a term that I've never heard before until I started talking to, I say this wisely, middle-aged women. <laughs> brain, brain fog is not a term that men use, but it is something that women use, and I never knew. But now I say to women who couldn't see me, do you have brain fog? Oh, yes, Dr. Paul. I've had it for years. My husband doesn't understand me. I say, change your diet. Do these simple things. <laughs> That's what dysbiosis causes. It impacts your hormones. The amount of research that was going on with the microbiome and the benefits it can have. But I'll give you another useless fact. In 2011, NHS prescribing cost this country 11 billion pounds. In 2018, seven years later, it's cost 17.8 billion pounds. It's gone up by a factor of 50% in six years. <laughs> It's because we're getting fatter, and what am I going to say? It's because we're making the wrong food choices. I would much rather change my diet, exercise a little bit more, and take probiotic, rather than take Western pharmaceuticals, which are toxic, which all interact. Why don't we have good health? Our diets are lousy. So white van man, he's there eating, one of my friends calls it cottaging pie, I call it cottage pie. <laughs> he refuses to change. Our diet, we go for easy options, don't we? How many people every night cook a meal from scratch? <laughs> Most people in this room. Do you know why? because you're here listening to this talk, you're interested in your health and well-being. If we were to do this straw poll in a pub across the road at lunchtime, how many people would raise their hands? That's, that's, well, in Henley it's probably quiet. Actually, I'll put you all in the coach, we'll go up to Sheffield. Our lifestyles have changed. We live a more sedentary life. Apart from Henley, where everyone's going to Our environment is changing. There are more pollutants around us. There are certain cities that we've seen on the news where the level of atmospheric pollution is so bad that people are told not to leave their houses. It's, I think it happened in London this summer. Don't leave your house because it's, there's so much pollution outside. Your children will get ill. Schools close. Can we do anything about this, our environment? Yes, we probably can, but it needs governments to do it. Or it needs us as individuals to influence governments to do it. There is a global health crisis. We all, as individuals, can make choices to impact our own well-being. I think I'm probably about here. If I make some more changes, I can probably get here. Elitism is a word that people don't like. But elite health is 
a phrase that I really do like because it gives us the opportunity to be out there rowing on the water when we're 70 or 80 rather than being here where I will be unable to leave my chair at 70 or 80. These are the simple things we can do. Change your diet, remove unhealthy foods, add some probiotics. There is no point in taking probiotics unless you have some prebiotic. That is a simple, simple fact. In terms of the probiotics as therapy, there's only one thing that's currently prescribed globally. It's BSL-3, it's prescribed by gastroenterologists. It's a combination of eight different bacteria at huge dose. Most probiotics that you buy will have about between five and 10 billion organisms. This one has 450 billion. It is a prescription drug. It's the first of many that will be produced. The global pharma companies, Fiber, uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, are starting to develop huge research programs on the microbiome. This is such an exciting area of medicine that's coming through. I'll probably be retired at 57 by the time it's there, but I hope in my old age, I'm taking this sort of drug rather than Western Pharma if I need anything. Uh, you can actually put it on Amazon. Yes, but it's not that one. Yeah, you can. Not at that dose. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. We've just changed it. Just changed Have they? It. Yeah. I apologise. I, I told you I don't know everything. <laughs> so this is the slide that we saw earlier. This one fascinated me. This was on BBC News and there's quite a few articles in the medical press about it. Your gut bacteria actually are impacting chemotherapy. Wow. That, that for me is just, who would have known? How, how, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because your gut bacteria are actually the main engine of our bodies. And this is a really exciting time for all of us. So what's the answer? Should the doctor consider a patient as a single organism? How do, how do we as doctors start treating people? Do we actually think, yes, you've come with this, but I'm more interested in the bugs that are in your gut? Probably, yes, I should be. If I ask any of my GP partners, or if I ask any of the GPs in Sheffield about the microbiome, they will know nothing. And that's very sad. And if I can do something as a doctor to try and influence that, happy days. The reason I got interested in this was because of Terry Rigby, who's at the back. Hi, Terry. But also because of a program by a fantastic doctor called Michael Mosley. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I want to be that guy. If only I could be like him. That's it. Thank you. Fascinating. Has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask? Yeah. So everything you've said makes perfect sense. Yeah. But you also said something that's quite interesting that other GPs don't push this point at all. Yeah. So I think you forgive cynics for thinking it was a bit of a fad. What would be your view on that? Um, I don't think you could say the microbiome is a fad because ever since organisms were in the sea and have come out of the sea and there have been dinosaurs and humans have evolved, the microbiome has been there. It's not going to go away. The way that we look at the microbiome and the research that's being done on it would prove it's not an alkaline diet, it's not a cabbage diet, it's not um, just eat protein and ignore everything else. This is something which is going to become an embedded part of our lives. Does that answer your question? Anyone? Uh, busy day, what do you grab to eat to stay healthy? Um, I will probably have in the morning, uh, I, do, I, I personally do take supplements. Um, lunchtime, 
some fruit, and in the evening, Lisa, who's at the back there, we started doing something called Gusto, which is um, fresh food delivered with ingredients, which tends to be high protein, um, plenty of vegetables, not that much carbohydrate, zero processed foods. We used to go to Waitrose and get simple ready meals and we were getting fatter and sluggish. And we both said, we have to change. So I'm, I could come and live in Henley, actually, because I make my own food. <laughs> I don't eat breakfast. I, I, I'll tell you the truth, I'm not going to lie. I don't eat breakfast. But you have a shave, don't you? I have, yeah. So do, can I just say, so the education really needs to start at schools. It has to start in schools. And in medical school. And nursing I mean, school, and that's where chiropractic school, and physio yeah. school, oh, and... Yeah. Yeah. So as you say, we're all converts really anyway, yeah. but it's the, it's the, it needs to start right at the base mm -hmm. of, of the new It needs generation. to start in school. school. Food, food yeah. education has to yeah. start in school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it should, probably start in, it should probably start in parenting classes. Yes. Yes. So when people go for antenatal care, yes. they should be taught about food. Exactly. Yes. I, I was involved, sorry, I'll, I'll ask this. I was involved in a project which I was also passionate about in the uh, mid 90s. I was trying to get schools to have vegetable gardens in Sheffield. And we went to, I think it was 25 schools to try, these are infant junior schools, to try and encourage children to grow their own food, to see that food came from seeds. And the schools turned around and said, we haven't got funding for it. If you can fund it, you can do it. We got funding for about 20. The astonishing thing is that we did it for about two years and we grew these beautiful vegetables, carrots, potatoes, leeks, things and put them on tables, children did not know that any of these things grew in the ground. They thought they came from plastic packets in the supermarkets. Because the parents had never taught them. So food health has to come from school and preschool children's education. Sorry. One of the things that's happened with doctors who um, Liverpool medical students have asked for nutritional advice to go into their degree, and also the BMJ has got a CPD thing about nutrition. So they are starting to do it for doctors. I just wanted to declare my hand because I've written a book, but one of the things that's just happened just now, someone just said to me, so what food do I eat? And um, whenever I've come across, it's fantastic, amount of information in there, what do you actually practically do? And, um, sorry about this, but I've, I've written something coming out in April which is based on the same as Bees and Tesco's and it's practical and it's a full week, what do you actually eat? And it's a full week and beyond. Because this is great, I work with people at Northern Food Banks in High Wycombe, they need to know actually what to eat, because we might not, we might know. And doctors now are asking for it to give it to patients in their surgeries. Nutritionists want it because they're sick of doing meal plans and they charge 250 quid for a meal plan for 10 days. We have to talk all day, but the most important thing is you have to know what to eat. Yeah. And it's going to be a big And that app, what's the app called? That's very important to have, isn't it? Yes. Food scanner. Food scanner. Yeah. If you, if you, can I say something? I just said, I know I'm not from this area, but obviously I forgot to say that Maggie and Debbie know a lot about the food issues. And I think all our friends of theirs or contacts that have people to, if you want more personal information about your own diet, then there's lots of great people in this area. Change of life. Change of life. Lots of them change. So I am an advocate of pre and probiotics. I used to, I have a degree in sports medicine and people spoke to me about supplements and our training, because I'm a 1985 graduate, our training at medical school was that as long as you had a healthy diet, you didn't need any supplements at all. The more I read about food manufacture and food production, in 1985 you couldn't buy strawberries from South Africa in a local co-op. You can now. But also in 1985, fruit didn't look uniform and perfect. 
vegetables came in different shapes and sizes, probably because they were grown properly. Nowadays, a lot of food that we eat is force manufactured, it's genetically engineered, it will definitely have had pesticides, herbicide, growth stimulant. If any of you eat meat, the majority of meat that is produced, apart from Henley, in the UK <laughs> will probably have had hormones, antibiotics introduced to make sure that that livestock is perfectly well. The nutrients that are in our food today are not the same as the nutrients that were in our food 30 years ago. That's why I take supplements, because I think I need them. The majority of the elderly population um, are deficient in certain minerals. Probably the most important is magnesium. Magnesium is very important for gut health. I would advise you all, if you're over 50, to start taking some magnesium supplementation because it's going to improve your well-being. You said earlier on that yeah, I, 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 it's, get rid of the magnesium. Yeah, it was my error. Was it? I was confused. It was an error. No, it was an error. I knew I said it, but I almost wanted to. Does anybody else tell me, um, I work a lot with children, yeah. babies and yes. mothers, yeah. and babies with problems. Yeah. And um, so when, it, when, we, when we discuss prebiotics and probiotics, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if the VSL is available for children and babies, because there's a big <laughs> problem with yeah. guts and babies. Yeah, there is, but I think VSL is very specific for inflammatory bowel disease. Just, oh, so specific so to that's So what, that's what it's prescribed for. Would you recommend infant pre um, prebiotics? Yes, I would, but it's, again, it, it depends what the babies are eating. If mums are feeding their babies... Well, there's a variety of things, but... Yeah. <laughs> depends on if they're breastfeeding or mixed feeding or formula fed for me to decide what they're doing but I just wondered if there was any advice you could give on which I, ones to use um, for babies. No, there's no particular brand that I would okay. recommend for babies. Would you babies. give them prebiotics? I, I would just ensure that mums are trying to feed them properly because in, so in, again, in, again in Sheffield yes. we have children aged two and three who are living on a diet of McDonald's. Well, even before that, while they're infants and they're just, I get a lot of gut problems when they're still, you know, pre-food. Yeah. So I just wondered if you also use a prebiotic then. No, I, I don't. No. But so probably I should, but I don't, because it's difficult to recommend a specific manufacturer. Right. Or, just, okay. Right, just take a couple more questions. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Just wondered. Um, Impact on bile in the stomach. So if you've removed a gallbladder, yep. you might have bile sloshing around yep. in your gut. What impact could that have? And can you help that through diet? Uh, definitely through diet, yeah. um, because obviously if you eat fatty food, yeah. if you eat food that has a high sugar content, yeah. if you eat spicy food. Yeah your stomach will produce more acid, yeah. which will cause your liver to produce more bile. Yeah. So food choices, whether pro and prebiotics, or probiotics help with people who've had colostectomy, I don't know. I told you it would be a lot of things where I can't actually say yes or no. But undoubtedly, there will be research done on topics like this. And I'm sure in time, the manufacturers will develop combinations of probiotic to treat that very specific condition. One more question. Uh, how does um, shop bought kefir and shop bought uh, sour? They're different. Um, I, no, I think how they compare to homemade? I, I would think they're probably different because they will contain stabilizers usually and emulsifiers. So, so homemade will definitely be better. But that's why homemade goes off after five or six days yeah. if you don't drink it. Yeah. Whereas shop bought will have a shelf life until mid December. Yeah. I know because I went into Waitrose and bought some yesterday. And I was looking at it and I thought, when does this expire? Six weeks. I thought the kefir I make at home will yeah. never last six weeks if I don't drink it. Because it's alive, it's alive. You want it to be alive. You want it to have as many bugs in it as possible, don't you? But is it better? Sorry. Is it better to have the shop bought than nothing at all? Yes. Yeah.
Is that quick enough answer? <laughs> That's it. Sorry. One more question, go on. Sorry. Uh, just really to highlight the mental and emotional health gut issue, which yes. is my specialist area. Yeah. And thinking about the babies, I also treat a lot of babies. Very often the mother's digestive health history and her current emotional yes. status is the thing to treat rather than the baby and yep. the baby's oh, feeding. Of course, it's you know, thing. I couldn't go to the whole No, time. I know. So just to highlight that and to introduce you all to a guy called Professor Emma Mayo from California, who's a professor of psychiatry and various other things. And he actually recently said, in the future, psychiatrists will have to treat the brain and the gut rather than the brain and the head. So just supporting everything you say. Yeah. yeah. So Thank you, really everyone. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a delight.